It's now my very great pleasure to introduce Anthony Tomasini, who as chief classical music critic for the New York Times has been guiding us through and informing us about the wonders of the world of orchestras, opera, major international festivals, and creators and performers of both classical and contemporary music. His books include a biography of Virgil Thompson and the New York Times essential library, Opera. He is as well a scribe and a scholar of musical theater, a knowing voice in Times talks with celebrities, musical celebrities, a director of musical arts, and he's recorded two albums of music of Virgil Thompson. The Indispensable Composers is Anthony's latest gift to music lovers. Kirkus Reviews describes it as, quote, a spiritual, spirited musical compendium to the best of the best. Tomasini's goal is to keep his assessments simple, insightful, and jargon-free, and he succeeds. Entertaining, highly enthusiastic, and very knowledgeable, he's the perfect guide to the great composers, all exuberantly presented for your edification and enjoyment, end quote. Anthony has devoted a lifetime to asking, thinking about, and answering the most essential, profound, and challenging questions about music. Why does music move us? How does it work? Fortunately, he hasn't kept his discoveries and realizations to himself. But best of all, he's here tonight to share them with us directly. I know we're all eager to hear what he has to say and play tonight. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Anthony Tomasini to the Free Library. Uh, hi, I'm very happy to be here and honored to be part of this very eminent series. Um, okay, um, this, I want to talk about the book a little. I'm not going to play a lot, but I'm going to play a little. I don't play the piano in public so much these days, and I'm quite, quite out of shape because I haven't been, I only this morning remembered, oh yeah, I have a piano. I should uh, practice a little. But anyway, I, uh, I'm going to use it to illustrate some points. Um, this book came out of uh, an intellectual gain. That was what started it in 2011. I had this idea to, have, to write a series of articles about who are the top 10 composers in music history. And uh, one of my editors said, I'm gonna pretend you didn't suggest this idea. <laughs> Another, but the culture editor at the time, at the Times thought it was great. And he said, don't think too small, think big. Make a whole series. I did five videos. There was a whole series of articles. And I said from the beginning that it's just an intellectual game. Really, this list doesn't, what the actual list is doesn't matter. But how do you determine the list? That's interesting. Take, is it Matt skill at various elements of music? How about influence? Arnold Schoenberg was the most influential composer of the 20th century. Everyone, after he came up with this 12-tone you know, music th theory idea, everyone in his wake had to deal with it. You could reject it, or you could embrace it, or you could part, but you couldn't ignore it. You know? And does that make him one of the greats? You know, uh, so it just, it just, it just, so I, anyway, I played it like a game. And, but the only way to play any game is seriously. So I really tried to be serious about it. And I had people write in who just thought it was wonderful and were playing along. We got thousands of online posts about it. Other people hated it, you know, thought it was destructive. Um, but then there were other people thinking, well, this whole game is stupid, but here's my list, you know. <laughs> and don't you dare leave out Mahler, you know, like. And, so I did it, and while I was writing it, two publishers called me and said, turn it into a book. I said, no. Uh, you know, as an intellectual game is one thing, but a book is too pretentious, you know, because I don't really believe there's a top 10 list, you know. But, but I, then I thought about it for like a year, and I got an agent, and, and I decided, well, if I could sort of drop the game, and, you know, because a lot of people wrote in, oh, I love what you're doing, but I feel like you have so much more to say than what you're saying. So, um... I was persuaded, and I had found wonderful editors and people at Penguin Press to go along, but the, the, my fear, this book was, this is my fourth book, and this was the hardest by far, because um, I, I was afraid that it was going to come out like something that could be called The Great Composers, which was a book I never wanted to write. And in a way, that's what this book is. But I tried to do everything I could to make it not read that way. You know, um, 
It's, it's got history in it. It's what, there, you find out what you need to know about the Wunderkind, Mozart and stuff. It's got criticism, my take on things, but it's got lots of personal experiences. Not just, you know, it opens with when I was 13 years old and I had a new piano teacher who was a big Bach devotee. She said, you don't know the B minor mass. You have to go out and get a recording. It's the greatest work ever written. And I, have my, I recreate my 13-year-old mindset listening to that piece and s explaining that I was overwhelmed from the start. But right, I swear, and I detail this in the book, from the first moments, there, this thing in the soprano line, I thought it goes up by step. And I thought it was going to rise, and it didn't. It stayed on this, this note, the F sharp. And I swear, I remember thinking, why did it do that? That's not what I thought it was going to do, you know. So I was already a critic, you know. I was already a, I, I was already a music educator, which I became too. Try, I had to know. It wasn't enough to be impressed. I had to know why did that do that, you know. So, the, and the personal experiences is not just perform, hearing Stravinsky conduct the Symphony of Psalms, you know, when I was in high school, or Bernstein conduct the Rite of Spring with Stravinsky in the audience and things like that. Um, uh, it's not only stuff like that, it's concerts I gave, playing a Mozart concerto when I had just turned 16 at Town Hall with a scrappy orchestra from Brooklyn because I'd won a competition. And, uh, uh, and, and then th even as a critic too, uh, when I talk about Aida, I segue into meeting Lean Teen Price and when she wrote a little storybook version of Aida and she went up to Harlem to read it to Harlem school kids and I went along with her. And these kids thought, like the queen of, uh, you know, Africa and American, you know, everything had showed up. They couldn't, believe, you know, and she sang for them too. But they asked her all about Aida, and so things like that are in the book. And uh, teachers, and um, I, I have all detailed stuff about Mozart and Mozart operas, but I don't particularly talk about. Um, the Jupiter Symphony a lot, but I have a whole riff on the differences between the play version and the film version of Amadeus, <laughs> which, I th which I think is interesting, and I don't like the film so much, but I love the play. So anyway, I don't think it reads like a book about the great, the great composers, and, and I'm, I'm pretty pleased with it. Um, but the only other hesitation I had was this greatness thing, and my introduction, in the introduction, I said, isn't classical music too upset? All the arts, maybe, but especially classical music, the obsession with greatness and the canon, and even the religious connotation of the word canon makes it sound like, you know, we, there's an accepted dogma of pieces that we all extol as great. And the, main, the biggest downside of greatness is that it, we, it winds up creeping into our perception of contemporary art. And the most important thing I do as a critic is deal with new music and living composers and you know, emerging performers, not you know, old Thomas Beecham recordings. And, uh, and it, it, you just have to try, I mean, the, the thing I love most about contemporary music is that it puts out of your mind whether something's achieved greatness or where it is going to wind up if it does in the Pantheon. You don't even think, if, if you read a new novel, and you're excited about it, you want your friends to read about it, read it, you want to talk about it, maybe argue about it, but no one's thinking, is this the next Proust or Dickens or something? You're just in, swept up in it. So I was a little reluctant to get obsessed about greatness, but so I have this introduction where I take down greatness. Then halfway through I say, but we can't help it. These people, they like guide us through our lives and we date our lives by the time we had this experience. So I'm gonna try to do something really hard in this book. I'm gonna try to ask, say, well, what's the big deal about Schubert? You know, what's the big deal about Verdi? You know, like, uh, and that, that's what I uh, attempt to do. And then I also, the, the other thing about, um, being a critic, even at, at the times, is uh, where our readership is so informed. And uh, boy, if I make a mistake, uh, boy, do I get, do I hear from people? And uh, but and and that's great, and it's a privilege. But if I review uh, like a new production of a Wagner opera, I'm writing to Wagner scholars, Wagner conductors, Wagner singers, people who know more than I do, and I'm writing to people who've never seen a Wagner opera. 
And I have to try to say something of interest to all of them. And that is not easy, but that's what I try to do in this book. So I, I have a way, as I do in my criticism of, I, whenever I use a technical term, I try to use, enough, if I talk about, I wouldn't just say chromatic harmony, I'd say wayward chromatic harmony or wandering chromatic harmony to give you an idea of you know, sort of what that means. And I do that with counterpoint in the beginning, you know, I have Monteverdi and Balkan and you know, like multi-layered counterpoint or multi-voice or you know, the intricate layering. Of, I, I throw in other words to sort of suggest, but then every once in a while in the book I stop. And the attitude, I'm, the, the mind stance I'm going for is, I say, okay, I've used this word a little, you know, and you know what it means, right? And, and, I, and, you know, we, and, and I want the reader to say, yeah, yeah, even if, they're, if the reader's not a musician, yeah, I know, I know. But I'm gonna really take a moment now and actually explain it, really explain it, you know, and, and I do. Plus the e-book e ver version of this book has four of my long, longer times videos that I've over the past years made videos at the Times. They're all on the Times website on YouTube where I, the, the crew comes over to my apartment and I sit at the piano and play things just like I'm gonna do now and talk about them, you know, and, um, and I have one in the book, there's one on counterpoint to mention, one on dissonance, one on bel canto. What is, what is that? We, that word's thrown around all the time. But I not only have Bellini, I have Bach, I have Burt Bacharach, you know, like, uh, in, 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 in it. And, and then, um, what's the fourth? I can't, dissonance, I think. I, um, but, you, so, you know, I, those are there too for you to see. But the one thing that is the hardest thing, I'm gonna deal now with the most sophisticated thing in music, that's the hardest thing to explain which is about use of motifs or motivic development, it's sometimes called, that one of the big challenges of contemporary, of classical music, and it applies to, uh, it's what makes it hard, especially it makes it both hard in this day and age um, and a kind of oasis, you know, like with everybody's decreasing attention spans and you know, the, the immediacy of everything, that you have to be able to immediately know everything. Classical pieces are long. Even a 20 minute Haydn string quartet, it only makes sense if you hear the whole thing. You know, like you have to hear, and then you know, it's a bit like if, when you get to the point where you hear something and, oh yeah, I heard that theme before. That's a very significant thing to notice. And, and that's hard, you know, today. Now, if, so, but the, it's not just themes that often in pieces, embedded in the, in the, the, tech, the elements of the piece are tiny little few note motifs, little groups of notes, not a whole theme. And the Eroka Symphony is an amazing example of that. It's like a 15 minute piece, four very, very different movements it seems like, but there are a few little moti motivic elements that run through that every measure practically of that piece. And you may not hear that, but it makes it, it's the reason that the piece sounds like a piece. It sounds like, yeah, that had to be that way. You know, like it just, I don't know why, but it is. So I, that, and that's very hard to explain. Um, I'm gonna try a little using Puccini and Beethoven. Um, it's, this element is a little easier to hear in opera because uh, we use, because composers, like, like think of Wagner, you know, light motifs. You know, they run through all of his operas. They, or he was a huge student of Beethoven, who was the master of all masters when it came to this technique. But Puccini too. But it's not just, you know, Rodolfo's the aria and Mimi's aria that come back and you hear them in various, you know, guises and under, you know, sometimes when they're fighting, having a fight on stage in the orchestra is playing their love tunes and it's all, it's ironic and it's sweet. But there are very subtle things that, you, that I missed for years until I said, oh yeah, that's where I hear that. And that's why it affects me so much. So I'm gonna try to, uh, I'm gonna use one example of in, in La Boheme. And then, my God, for someone who hasn't played very much, I'm gonna, the, other, the best example in Beethoven is the Appassionata, which I, which I used to play quite a lot and pretty well, but no longer, but anyway, I can still, I can make my point, I think. Okay, first, Puccini. So, you can hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, okay. Okay, 
How does this opera end? Let me. Do, do we all just, I assume most people know the opera uh, here? Okay, yeah. Okay, Mimi goes back to the garret, uh, you know, to die in Rodolfo's arms, and she, she is actually not in his arms usually, but she does die there amid him. And it ends this way. You know, when, the, when he finally realizes, she said, the brass chords go. Now, what is this? Oops, sorry. Have we heard that before? Yes. Do you all, you, maybe this is a very informed audience, I bet that you all know it. Okay, so this is the, the Bohemian, they're all gathered together and they realize they have to give Rodolfo and Mimi a chance to be alone, you know. And Mimi, they think she's asleep. And, and then she says, are they gone now? You know, and then she says, I was just pretending to be asleep. And she, this is the tune, different key. Okay, there's that theme. So at the end, in this key, you know, Puccini repeats it. So now the orchestra is telling us She's not pretending anymore. She was pretending before. Okay, but what, what are these chords? Oh, sorry, my harmony. Have we heard them before? Yes, a little earlier, the oddest thing. Colina, the philosopher in the group, who just struts around cracking puns and uttering ponderosities and stuff. Um, everybody has to contribute. The only thing of any value he has is this coat. So he sings a little aria farewell to his coat. He says, you've served me well. You've never bowed down to any aristocrat or anything. And so then the last phrase, this what it ends like that. And what do you hear? There are those chords. So at the end of the opera, we hear the chords that ended Colina's coat aria? Like, what? Uh, they're neat chords, but well, what are those chords associated with? In the first act, Schoenart shows up with a little money. And they just, it's Christmas Eve, and they decide to go out to their favorite place, the Cafe Momus, which they usually go to. They don't have any money, and, but they go anyway. And uh, so now, uh, so Schoenard says, no, 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 we're not going to eat here. We have to go out. It's Christmas Eve when you hear. Okay, it's a major, this is. A second act, it's, in big, it's brassy when they actually show up at the cafe. So do you hear, you hear the, 
They're completely related, except one's in major, and then this one is in minor. Okay, now, what is that saying? What is Puccini saying? Well, what is Bohem about? The moral of Bohem is that it's fine to be young and carefree and penniless, penniless and artsy uh, if you're healthy. Terminal illness is an adult problem. And when Rodolfo realizes that Mimi just doesn't have a chronic cough, she's dying. He can't hack it. He can't face it. He flees from it. And you know, it's very interesting in the score. She, show, he show, she shows up at the end. Puccini is very, when, and Musetta hocks her earrings and buys a, a muff, you know, and then it's brought to Mimi. And she turns to Rodolfo and says, oh, did you, you spendthrift, did you buy this for me? And Musetta says, yes, he did, which is a lie. And that's when Puccini writes, Rodolfo starts to cry. Because he, he couldn't even afford to do that for her. So the, at the end of, but why does the opera end with this? Puccini sang and the orchestra sang. Those days of carefree bohemian life, Going to the Cafe Mumus when you can't afford it, they're over. Everybody has to grow up. You know, you have to come to terms with this. And, and that's the lesson they learn. You know? And it's done through this, these subtle, subtle things. OK, do I have time for the passion? No, no, let's see. Yeah. OK. Now, now Beethoven, this is much more sophisticated. Um, but the, the question here is, how many people, Beethoven's Appassionata, do you, how many know, know it? Most people, okay. All right, it's very hard, and I'm not gonna play the hard parts, but um, okay. Now, uh, in the, you know, Beethoven, you know, what's uh, the theme, you know, is, is that a melody? No, that's not a melody, not much of a melody, it's a motive, you know, but anyway, and the Appassionata begins like this. Let me give you a brief summary, all right, the first movement. Okay, and what's the second movement? Set of variations. And then the third movement, the, the, the big, okay. They sound very, very different, right? Ha uh -huh, they're not. Okay, um, okay, we have this. This. this is the theme. It's not much of a theme. It's just you know, you know our F minor chord in arpeggio, but but then this dotted rhythm. That's interesting. But this is. You have to. Again, this little second, you know, da da da. Then, okay. Then he goes, whatever. You know, but this, so we have um, now. Even when it gets going, Da, 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 the whole piece. Then you know, we finally do this. 
And then the second theme There, remember this. Well, we have to get some use out of that. So Beethoven turns it into major. Okay, right. So you're, you're following that this, that the really the whole guts of this movement is just that little thing. Now the second movement doesn't sound anything like that, does it? Oh yeah, listen to this thing. This is the theme. Take away the chords. It's pretty dull. But what do you have? And remember? It's the same notes. This. Uh, do, you, do you see? Yeah, so this too is. And then the, the vari variations. Oh, I'm sorry, where am I? Here we go. Okay, now it's so lyrical, and he says super legato that you don't even notice that really what's hanging the whole thing together is that. and. Now, what about the crazy last movement? That has nothing to do with that little two-note thing we have. And so on. See, I told you I wasn't practicing. OK, now let's take this apart. Here's it. Here are the two note little groupings. point it goes really virtual. Okay, and what's going on there? sounds so you know coherent and organized and stuff that it's really this little dumb in a way two note thing you know in various keys links every bit of it the themes actually he almost tries not to make them too interesting the melody you know theme interesting lest you just he distracts your attention from so Wagner who was a huge um, devotee of Beethoven studied that carefully you know when he was coming up with this idea of leitmotifs and stuff. Um, okay, what is it now? Let me see what time is it. Well, we have a little more time. Um, why don't sh I could uh, just open up to questions now, or do you, or I could talk a little. All I was originally thought I might read something from the book, but maybe do you would like to hear something? Okay. Um, maybe an example of um, the story on price is pretty moving, or. <laughs> Uh, does that sound good? Okay. Um, it's one I'm talking about. The Aida of my youth when I was in high school. I mean, that's one thing about my job. 
when to hear in my very early years here Price or Tabaldi, Nielsen to meet all these people later, I wound up writing the obit obituary for Renato Tabaldi. I mean, if you had told me <laughs> when I was sitting in, and when I had standing room seats, you know, to hear as Desdemona in uh, Otello that I would do that someday, it's like wow, you know, an interviewer and stuff. But anyway. I talk about the plot. Many years after attending my first Aida, I was honored to spend time with Lean Team Price for some New York Times stories. As an African-American artist who grew up in segregated Mississippi, Price understood prejudice and injustice. In 1955, when NBC Opera Theater, a television series that broadcast live staged operas, chose Price to sing the title role of Puccini's Tosca, many network affiliates in the South, including her home state, refused to show a program featuring a black Tosca and her white lover. So Price brought a personal connection to music that depicts a character torn between duty to her oppressed people and an illicit love for an enemy of her nation. In 2000, I accompanied Price on a visit to a group of school children in Harlem where she read a storybook version of Aida she had written and in a surprise sang before an assembly. After which she took some questions, one younger uh, one youngster asked why I, the audience, this was Harlem, it was a, a public school, it was almost all the kids were black or you know, Hispanic, but mostly bl black. One youngster asked Aida what, what was her, why Aida was her favorite role. Price answered, when I sang Aida, I used the most important plus I have. You have it, I have it, this beautiful skin. When I sang Aida, my skin was my costume, you know. Um, another comment Price made to those children in Harlem seemed especially revealing. She was asked if there was something about the story of the opera that she might change if she could. Yes, Price said. Rather than sacrificing herself for her lover, she would have wanted Aida to sacrifice her love and return to her country with her father to fulfill her duty. Um, I have a hunch that Verdi would have been intrigued by that twist on the story. Um, I'm just going to read one more short thing and then take questions because I love answering questions. Um, I talk at one point, I'm trying to get at what is the deal about Chopin. Now Chopin, you have to understand, 1810 was born, also Schumann, Mendelssohn and Liszt born around the time, same time. Brahms came later, 1833. But Beethoven was still alive. He died in 1827. Beethoven in, almost invented the Colossus as composer mo model and the symphonic imperative. Brahms, you know, took him almost 20 years to write his first symphony. Like, who could write a symphony after Beethoven? You know, and so Schumann, who had this crazy imagination, you know, was also thought, I have to write symphonies and piano sonatas and stuff. Uh, everybody uh, operated under that burden, not Chopin. He cared nothing about that. He wasn't even particularly interested in the other music of his time, except opera. He adored opera, Bellini, and stuff, and he loved Bach and Mozart. He didn't want to write an opera, he didn't want to write a symphony, he just wanted to write his piano pieces. You know? um, so, uh, but yet there's something crazy in the music, it's so ingeniously written. But when I was a, a senior at Yale, um, I had a recital where I played a Haydn sonata, then my first late Beethoven piano sonata, Opus 110, uh, number 31, um, and then Schoenberg, uh, Five Pieces, which was the first time I ever, I mean, it took me a year to learn that, but I loved it. And then a Chopin Nocturne and a Chopin Ballade, the first Ballade. And the Ballade was very hard, technically, but it was emotionally harder. I mean, and I explain, I, I, I talk about this, not to be over-revealing in my book or even now, but, but um, uh, I say the recital was the culmination of my undergraduate education, blah, blah, blah. I, I, I already said all these. Um, but to end, I paired a, I, oh, I, this is good, I say, um, <laughs> uh, uh, to end, I paired a Chopin Nocturne with that first ballade. The ballad in G minor, composed over several years, completed in 1835, opens with an elusive rising line in parallel octaves that sort of traces a quizzical harmony, what's known as a Neapolitan six chord. It drifts off, then the right hand plays a sighing three-note melodic gesture over two questioning chords. The second one, bitterly sweet, spiked with dissonance. There's no resolution. Instead, after a moment of silence, the main matter of the piece, it seems, begins with the saddest theme imaginable 
accompanied by poignant chords. The ballade builds in intensity, breaks, and then I describe the ballad more, but, um, and I say, though this ballad contains virtuosic flights, technically thorny passages, and that hell-bent coda, the music is effectively conceived for the piano. What really made it so difficult for me, however, was not the technical challenges, then the emotional tug. Even in places where the ballad bursts forth uh, with virtuosic brilliance, the music dips into deep reservoirs of feeling, both sadness and passion, often at the same time. It dissects every facet of those contrasting themes and explore, explores every implication of the wrenching harmonies. The late Beethoven sonata took me to a spiritual place. The Schoenberg engaged my intellect, challenging me to find beauty and complexity. But that Chopinic blood exposed me, uh, while also demanding that I dispatch a formidable piano piece. There I was, just turned 22, still sorting out being gay, full of longings, including for a few friends sitting in the front row at this recital. <laughs> Chopin allowed me no secrets when playing his ballade. And, and now I say that not, you know, and not just to be revealing uh, you know, of, of an experience in the book, because I felt like it got at something about Chopin. It gets at what's going on in that music. It's just, uh, um, it's, Really, the, Chopin is one composer who's maybe harmed by his own popularity. Oh, Chopin, oh, we all love Chopin. That stuff is crazy, some of that music, you know, and, and, and ingenious. Um, okay, now, questions. I'd love to take, do, do you, and there's a microphone if, um, and you can ask me anything about the failing New York Times, which is not at all failing. <laughs> and, uh, 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 two two yes, questions sure. unrelated, one is, I have read reviews of the book, but I've not read your book yet. It was just yet. out, so yet. it's, it's be, 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 be I hard. understand uh, that you have a passion, as do I, for Schubert. Yes, I do. And I'd love you to make some comments about him, because I think some of the things you say about, sh just said about Chopin, yeah. would equally apply to Schubert. Yeah, I, 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 I like my, my, the opening of my Schubert chapter, I place him and at 17 years old. He's teaching in his father's school, he's miserable. He had been a Vienna choir, in the Vienna Choir Boys, singing, getting good education, singing major choral works, you know, uh, um, he, he really sophisticated stuff. And there he is teaching school boys who hate him. And he, you know, he was dumpy a little and people called him, had, his friends had a nickname for him, Mushroom, they called him. And, um, and he was miserable. Uh, and so almost to, to show what I'm, cap I'm capable of. Schubert, Schubert, uh, Schubert writes, Earl, uh, Gretchen am Spinrad, you know, like a song that changes everything about what German leader is. And it's very interesting because it's a portrait of the, the character from Faust. And it's very important that she has been romanced by Faust but has not slept with him yet, you know, the now young Faust. Um, and she has this spinning wheel, and the ya da 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 and the piano imitates the, sp you know, the spinning wheel. But she's saying, what has gone on? How, what is coming, what did he tap in me? What is this feeling I'm having? I can't stop thinking about him. You know, I just, I don't know, I'm going crazy. You know, with, what is this desire? And a scholar, I quote, says, it's amazing that, Chopin, that Schubert was able to uh, tap an adolescent, a young woman's feelings. And I say, well, maybe he knew, maybe he had longings for the Faust-like young man, you know, who, you know, who swept by. And I go into the whole theory that Schubert may have been gay. Although I say that in, there, there was no such thing as being gay, you know, in, in, in Schubert's day. But he had, a t it seems clear, I'm pretty convinced by that, you know, the scholarship that he had longings for friends and probably and f physical uh, relationships with men and and but it explains to me something about his music that there's something it's sometimes I feel like Schubert writes in code it's covert he likes writing in a covert language like why is some happy little forehand piano march why does it sound sad you know What's the tug on it? And you know, sometimes when there's a minor key piece theme in a Schubert piece, and then it switches to the major, it sounds sadder. 
in major and then it does in minor. Why? It's almost as if he's saying, you know, they're writing songs of love, but not for me. You know, like, like and then I contrast it to Mahler, you know, with his uh, nostalgia for, uh, f you know, folk tunes and Viennese waltzes and Lindler and stuff. Like when Mahler does that, Mahler says, yes, the world is a cataclysmic mess. But yes, I know. But, and it's tragic, but we have this, isn't it wonderful that we all have this wonderful folklore and simple things to, you know, get, but we're all in this together. Schubert says, I'm not, this is not for me. I'm not part of this, you know, and that I, it's amazing how, um, uh, how strongly I get that, you know, in, in his pieces. Also, it's a, just a very point, he didn't think he never thought of himself as a, I, you know, you can imagine he and his friends, they sat around in a cafe and Beethoven would go walking by. <gasps> it's Beethoven, you know, it's Beethoven, you know, like little did he know that he would be buried three graves away from Beethoven and that in no time he would consider that he would, the placement would be considered very merited, you know, uh, but he died knowing, having no idea, 31 years old, you know, having no idea. Anyway, another, I'm sorry, I should. We just one uh, unrelated. Did you, in making your so-called, if you did in the book, choice of the, did you re uh, restrict yourself to a time period? Yes. Because uh, there were great composers that most of us have not heard enough of their music. Absolutely. Forget. This, the, the thing I have to be careful about not being defensive about in this book is that there are many more than 10 composers. I dispensed with the whole top 10 thing. I, some, sometimes I'll say, eh, when I was doing my top 10 thing, I would, you know, but mostly I, there are probably 17 composers that have chapters, you know, and, and, but I do, I start with Monteverdi, the argument being that Renaissance and middle age music is a whole nother, you know, yeah. And Mon Mon Monteverdi is the first figure we, he bridges the, re the Renaissance to the Baroque. And in a way, at the end of the Renaissance, music got so complicated with counterpoint, you know, poly and in a way the Baroque was a corrective to that. It's, whew, enough. Um, and that's when opera was invented, you know, like, and uh, Monteverdi was in the ground floor of that, that, that stuff. And, and, uh, and I go into the 20th century, and I, I take us with new language, I have a chapter on, Schoenberg, Stravinsky, and Bartok. Then I just have an essay on what happened for the rest of the century and some, some things. Because my argument, my excuse being that we're t if, if greatness is the theme of this book, we're too close to know. You know and um, I, I use John Adams as an example. And I, you know, this piece I liked of his, the, t uh, the Gospel According to the Other Mary, you know, the a big oratorio. And I describe how much I like it. But then I say, but you know, it's too long. That's the only problem. But John Adams has never written a piece that isn't too long. They're all too long, you know. And I say, but that's what we think now. You know who had that said about him all the time? Schubert, the heavenly lens and stuff. Now nobody would say that. Now we don't, that's not a flaw. It's a characteristic, you know. And maybe that someday they'll say the same thing. No, they're not, John Adams isn't too long. Or they'll, maybe they'll 100 or 200 years they'll say, what was all the big deal about John Adams? Like maybe, we, who knows, you know, like, and in a way that's my excuse to say, the last 100 years of music is another book. Maybe I'll write that book someday, but that's not this book, you know, uh, yeah. so. Changing the subject, we here in Philadelphia are very proud of our orchestra. Oh, it's wonderful, yeah. And uh, two or three times a year, they go up to Carnegie Hall. Sure. After they've played three times here in Philadelphia, and they right. were all a little bit on tender hooks to say, well, yes, well, how will it go in New York? How, right, how right. will it go? So I'd be curious as to, as to what your opinion is of the orchestra and any relative comments compared yeah, to other great orchestras. Yeah, I mean, you can read my uh, opinion over the years, but um, yes, it's a tremendous orchestra. I think Yannick is amazing. He's a dynamo, he's a tremendous musician. Um, I am yet, I yet want, I'm waiting to see what is his real personal artistic vision. Um, I, you know, maybe I was a fan of Alan Gilbert at the Philharmonic, even some of my colleagues were not, but Alan had a mission, you know, like he, he knew what he, Alan, comes in and the, all the youth concerts that they did, he conducted them all. 
you know, Mazel, Mazor wouldn't, didn't look at them. Alan thought, what am I here for? This, I, I, who, if not me, you know, like, and he was, he brought in composers, he believed in composers, he really, you know, um, you know, the Met, Met Opera never staged Ligeti's crazy, wonderful opera, La Grand, La Grand Macabre. Alan said, we'll put it on. Stage performance, you know, you know, and I, I just, Yannick just, I still am waiting for his vision of what, what he's going to do. Now at the Met, you know, it's wonderful that he's at the Met, but, you know, he's, this is his first season as music director. He's not conducting until December. And, uh, you know, he, but they ca he came to the Times with Peter Gelb and they talked about how all the people they're going to commission and all this, okay, I'll see, let's see, you know, like I'm waiting. Um, but he's wonderful. I, love, I think he's a tremendous musician. And, uh, but I, I, my mantra about orchestras, since contemporary music, even though I've written a book about great dead composers, um, the uh, contemporary music is the most important thing I do. I mean, reviewing new work is by far the most important thing. You know, like, that's where I'm needed. You know, uh, the Eroica Symphony, a great, and even a good performance of the Eroica, what can you say? Well, we all know it, we all love it, it happened again. You know, like, and, um, <laughs> Uh, and I, you know, that's, whereas a new, new piece needs me, you know, what was this piece like? Tell us about it, you know, like, and, uh, and even if I'm wrong in my assessment, I don't care, at least, you know, I, I, cause it's so, so most fun to, to, to write about, but the, you know, that, that, that's by far the, the most important job, you know, that I do, that, 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 a, that a critic does. And I, I just, um, you know, who are the composers that Yanni is passionate about? living composers right now. I'm not saying, he may be, but I, I, don't, I don't know, I can't answer that question. You know, like, uh, but I wish him well and I think he's wonderful. You know, and the orchestra does sound great and they love him. He's, you know, he's certainly, um, yeah, he's, a, he's a great figure. Yeah. Yes. Who are the great contemporary composers? Who are the great ones? Oh. <laughs> Um, well, le if you look at just the younger people, uh, I like Andrew Norman uh, tremendously, Matthew Acoin, who just won a, um, you know, M M MacArthur Foundation Genius Award, is phenomenal com composer. Um, uh, this, they're interesting, com like this uh, very unusual composer, Kate Soper, who has a very strange, uh, flighty kind of, um, sort of mystical sensibility. I love her music, you know, and, and then of the older, older set, I mean, th this is what I mean about my, you know, a few years ago that met, I was at the world premiere 2000 in Salzburg of Kaya Sariajo's opera, um, Love, La Mort de Loire, uh, Love from Afar. And it finally two years, no, two years ago came to the Met. This is what, I uh, see, this is what makes me a little, you know, like I'm very proud of this book, but the real, the, when her opera was done, it was the first opera by a woman composer at the Met. It was only the second one in the Met's history. The, first, the previous one had been one act opera a hundred years earlier. And Susanna Malki, amazing Finnish conductor who conducted the fourth woman to ever conduct at the Metropolitan Opera, four. I mean, wow, you know, so, um, um, and then I came here last year and was very, very affected by Daniel Bernard Romain's opera, We Shall Not Be Moved, you know. Um, uh, I thought it was terrific, you know. Um, it, w it was really, um, and boy, what a Philadelphia piece that, that was. And, and it was a very creative idea to, um, rather than just depict that story, to have this idea of the homeless kids who take refuge in the shell of that building, not even knowing that, you know, that what had happened there, and uh, it was very powerful, and the ghosts. Uh, in your personal listening for leisure, which presumably you have some of, yeah. um, do you have a cycle of types of music you like to listen to, uh, to at times of day, during certain activities? And do you balance that with silence to kind of clear your head? Ah, now you're talking. Uh, silence. You know, actually, I, I hear so much music, and there's so much music I have to hear that I do value silence, actually. I don't, um, 
I um, am very eager to hear, like new recordings come in and I'll put them on. And sometimes I, when I'm in my home office working, I'll be listening to something in the background. You know, I know you're not supposed to do that, but we all do. And, um, uh, but for just really, I, you know, it's just, you can't believe how much music I, I listen to. So I, I don't, you know what I really love is musical theater though. And I, um, sometimes that for fun I'll do. And uh, I, I had a book party uh, that my husband uh, hosted at a little restaurant around the corner from us on, in New York. And um, uh, I've gotten to know over the years, I'm not bragging, but I'm bragging, uh, <laughs> Stephen Sondheim, who came with his, his husband, and, uh, uh, which was thrilling, you know, and um, talk about greatness, you know. And, uh, but, I, you know, his, uh, I, so it's, it's that kind of stuff that I, that I, I for, just enjoyment, you know, that I, I tend to listen to because I do listen to so much just for, or sometimes an opera, but, uh, you know, we don't have a car. That's one of the things in New York, but when, when we rent one, we, uh, we'll play Wagner or something or, uh, you know, uh, for a long drive, you know, um, or uh, opera, you know, sometimes. Although there's, you know, the radio is now so good, uh, so good, you know, there's the Beatles channel, there's a Frank Sinatra channel, and that, you know, Frank Sinatra, what a genius, oh my God. And uh, so, um, Anyway, yeah, yeah yes, yeah, sir. In your opinion, how transformative was the music of Claude Debussy? Amazing. The, he is, uh, I, after a few hundred years of pulsating Germanic music, to come along and write this stuff. Right. That was so, he is the most, rad, one of the most radical composers in history. But he disguises it because it's so sensual. Correct. You know, it's so gorgeous. And yet it's just. Sensual. Uh, sensual, yeah. And, right. um, and diaphanous. And yet it's radical. I, I, the chap, I, I, my chapter on him I title um, The Refined Radical. You know, and uh, he, Peleas is, uh, is coming to the Met with Yannick conducting, which I can't wait. That piece, it's like the first Freudian opera. I mean, you know, the, 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 what's going on on stage, you know, it's a love triangle and the, these two young people fall in love illicitly and, um, but the orchestra, and no, when nothing seems to be happening, the music is telling you everything that's going on, is psychoanalyzing them practically for us. It's, I can't, it's an amazing piece, you know. Uh, he, he's, um, and, uh, ta and everybody had to come to terms with him. Yet I know my, uh, I know people who think Peleus is a bore, you know, so there, there, there is somehow, there is that reaction, but uh, boy, that's not mine. Uh, two questions. Yeah. What's the difference between a Stephen Sondheim musical and an opera. Uh -huh. And the other question is, if we're going to have people listening to serious music right. in 50 years, how should students, kids in school, be introduced to music? Okay, those are two big questions. I once, years ago, um, years ago, um, Lincoln Center had this production of a piece, Marie Christine by Michael John Lacusa, and everybody was talking about is it an opera, is it a musical, is it an opera, is it a musical? So I went to it and I wrote an essay and I said, well, I don't know whether it's an opera or a musical, but it's not very good. And, uh, <laughs> but, but, and, and maybe because it's trying to do both, that's the problem. But I wrote a piece about uh, what the difference is and Steve Sondheim sent me a note congratulating me on the best explication yet written on this topic. But all I said was that both forms combine words and music. And um, words are very important in opera, music is very important in, you know, in a musical. But the mix is, in, in mu musicals, words drive music, the music. They come first. You know, in opera, it's the reverse. And if you accept that, I know I'm not saying huge difference, but they're slightly lean one way or the other. It's not complexity. Guys and Dolls is more complex musically than a lot of operas, you know. Uh, 
Um, it's not spoken dialogue. Lots of operas have spoken dialogue. It's not that. It's, um, it's this issue of the relationship of words and music. Um, and I used in that piece an example there. How many people, opera fans, can sing the whole com hum, the whole complex tune to Unbeldi, which is compl complicated tune. We, people, I bet a lot of you could sing the whole thing. How many people know the words beyond Unbeldi? You know, like, and whereas in musical theater, you can, something like, in olden days, a glimpse of stocking was looked on as something shocking, but now God knows anything good. You can't think one without the other. They're, they're embedded in your mind together. You know, like, um, that's, that's the, to me, the difference. About your question about young people, the challenge right now, th this is the challenge of our time. You know, like, and the at the one hand, the times depends on it, and, um, you know, it's, it's changed the world, but we have to wean ourselves, especially young people. Oh my gosh, uh, oh my gosh, you know, like it's just, I mean, I, like I'm old enough. Yeah, but this has really exacerbated it. I mean, it really, I mean, it's just um, the immediacy of getting back, you know, like I was talking to my, to my nieces and nephews at Thanksgiving, I said, I was, remember the time before, I remember the invent, when we didn't have a telephone answering machines, you know, like, and they got these things with tape. And I said, but you have to understand when we left, that when you left the house, you didn't think, my God, who's gonna call me today? <laughs> you thought, they'll get in touch with me eventually if they need to, and life went on, you know, like. So I just think we have to find it. And the, I think the biggest opportunity classical music has is to make, a virtue of what might seem a flaw. You've got to go there, you've, it's a live performance art form. You have to hear it live, you know. You know uh, and you just, and you have to put aside, shut out everything, and for you know, 50 minutes concentrate on the Eroga Symphony. And I mean, I've had the experience of bringing new neophytes to like the Rite of Spring or something. Um, uh, and it's just, I remember my wonderful cousin who lives and works at the Bronx Zoo. Um, she uh, is, is not, not a huge classical, but she came to me years ago. She came with me to Carnegie Hall where Berlin Philharmonic was playing Beethoven. And she turned to me and said, the sound, does it always sound like this? And I said, well, the Berlin Philharmonic playing Beethoven at Carnegie Hall is about as good as it gets. But yes, this is what classical music sounds like. This is what it sounds like, you know. And you ha so I think we have to say, this is your chance to block out all that stuff and turn yourself over, get, you know, give control to the composer and the performers and bask in this sound. Voices, when I was a kid, you know, I, I came from a very unmusical family. I went to these operas, I didn't even know what was going on. You know, years later, I'd say, oh, that's what's going on in La Traviata. You know, like, I didn't care. You know, the sound of these voices just, oh, it just hooked me so much. So I, I just think, you know, we, we, that, that we have to cherish that and ma make that into a virtue. Okay, to go back to your uh, top 10, um, was that at all crowdsourced? You said you had a lot of emails. Did you sort of accept the opinions that came into you? Question one. Question two. And a piece that you wrote a couple of weeks ago in the uh, uh, New York Times, you said the most interesting thing about that whole exercise was the analytics that went to the analysis. The, the what exercise? The analysis. Yeah. Uh, Could you talk about what, what, was, what constituted that analysis? Wait, the most interesting thing about what did you the, say? The whole top 10 process. Oh, I see. Yeah, what? the analysis. Right. Um, yeah. Um, the top 10 intellectual game, the, it was, the task was to try to be Specific, just what I did right here, being trying to be precise about Schubert. I tried to answer that question precisely, and I try in my book, and about Debussy, too, you know, and Chopin, when I read that. That's what all I'm talking about, you know, that trying to pinpoint what it is, you know, um, uh, about this stuff. And it's not always going to be the same. I mean, structure, for example, is more important in some composers than other composers, you know, uh, um, more conventional in some composers, and radical or all or lacking in other in, in other composers so that's what i meant just trying to whatever elements there are you know to 
to highlight to highlight them. And about the input, we didn't. I didn't crowd, but we got we had about two thousand uh, online comments posted, and I didn't add, reply to them all, but I replied to some. And I did. I wrote the articles in a way that was. I I kind of argued, you know, because I said um, I was in, I was moved to think that I had to push somebody out. I mean, we had. You can't have. Uh, the, the game was a process of elimination. You can't have four composers who lived within 75 years of each other in one city in Vienna take four places on the top 10 list. It just, you know, we can't have Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, and Schubert. Somebody's got to go. And I pushed out Haydn. And, uh, I, and, and, and I met, you know, Eric Kandel, the, you know, you know, He's a music fan. He bumped in. I, I met him at the Met, and he said, I loved your top 10 thing. It was great. You were very brave. He said, but what a mistake to push out Haydn. I would have pushed out Schubert. So, <laughs> that, so, so but in, in, in writing and responding in the moment, I did reply to people. And I said, and at one point, I was saying, people are writing in about this composer. That. Where are the Britain champions? Am I alone? I think this guy is amazing. He's going to, you know, like, and... Uh, and uh, what's wrong with you? I guess I have more work to do. You know, so I had I had that that kind of reaction. Anyway, I think that's it. Uh, um. Yes. No. Oh no. I mean, just to uh, the, to make that final point, the list and the book too. Although who, not many people would disagree with the p people. You know, I, I chose her. But yeah, it was ultimately my list. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. I had a wonderful time. <laughs>